We begin today's show looking at how Russia's invasion of Ukraine is leading to growing hunger in many African countries that rely heavily on Ukraine and Russia for wheat and fertilizer. This week, the World Food Program said nearly four and a half million tons of grain are blocked in Ukraine's ports. This comes as the number of people facing hunger at crisis or worse levels soared to unprecedented levels last year, passing a record set just the year before. That's according to a new published annual report by the Global Network Against Food Crises, an alliance that includes the United Nations and the European Union. U.N. food crisis analyst Luca Russo said the report does not yet factor in the impact of the war in Ukraine. We don't know yet what will be the effect of the, of the Ukraine crisis on the, on the overall global food insecurity. So this is something very important. So what is very important for us is to make sure, and I'm talking for on FAO, to make sure that we keep on monitoring the countries most at risk of, of uh, acute hunger and famine. Because at the moment, because of the attention that is paid to Ukraine, there is a, a risk that we simply forget about other crises. The new report finds nearly half a million people in Ethiopia, southern Madagascar, South Sudan and Yemen are already facing the most severe phase of acute food insecurity, catastrophe. On Wednesday, U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres addressed global food security during a meeting with the Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari. They both spoke to reporters in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. There is really no true solution to the problem of global food security without bringing back the agriculture production of Ukraine and the food and fertilizer production of Russia and Belarus into world markets despite the war. And I'm determined to do everything to facilitate a dialogue that can help achieve this objective. Coming at a time when the entire global attention is focused on the unfortunate situation in Ukraine, we in this region I feel already that the world is forgetting about us. There can be no better assurance that the world is with us as we confront extremist terrorist organizations, hunger, and the enormous problems of dealing with millions of displaced people than this important visit. Russian and Ukrainian imports account for 30 percent of all African wheat consumption. For more, we're joined by Lena Semet of the Human Rights Watch. She's their senior researcher and advocate on poverty and equality, with lead researcher for the new report as war continues, Africa food crisis looms. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Lena. Uh, it is great to have you with us, but under such dire circumstances. Can you explain how the war has exacerbated uh, not only the looming crisis, but the catastrophe that is taking place today in Africa? Thank you for having me. Yeah, so, so the war in Ukraine has uh, led to huge food shortages in many domestic markets in, in several African countries, but also send food prices to new levels. If you look at some of the, um, the food price indexes that the United Nations releases, the, one, um, the level in March has been the highest since it has been recorded in the 1990s. And so this has huge implications for domestic markets, um, in, in Nigeria, for example, the price of some essential staple foods, including wheat, jam, barley, has increased by uh, more than 30 percent in this last year and has further um, heightened since, since the war began. And so the problem really is that many people living on already low incomes that have been affected by the pandemic, that lost um, income then or economic activities, are now struggling to afford these increased prices for food and therefore skip meals, go hungry, and also reduce other um, expenses essential to fulfilling their rights, including health care or education. Alina, could you elaborate on that? I mean, as you the report points out, as you've said, even prior to the war, uh, uh, so many countries in Africa and also elsewhere, we're facing acute food insecurity. 
in part because of the pandemic. Could you explain how the pandemic exacerbated uh, existing conditions and what other, how exactly that happened and what other factors led to this worsening uh, uh, crisis and now uh, catastrophic following uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Yeah, so if we look at the numbers in 2020 around food insecurity, we see that many many um, regions within Africa, so West Africa, East Africa, had already extremely high levels of food insecurity. So I'm talking um, seven out of 10 people, six out of 10 people, so 60%, 70% of the population experiencing food insecurity. Um, and so the pandemic has exacerbated the situation further since it disrupted um, trade. Uh, it disrupted trade flows within the region also, so not only globally. Um, and therefore, there were already um, increasing prices in domestic markets. We also have to look at climate change events that occurred during this time, um, for instance, droughts in, in Kenya that reduced crop production. So um, all these changes within the availability of food has sent the food prices uh, um, to new levels. And, and so the war in Ukraine further exacerbates the situation since um, the two countries are among the top five global exporters of some staple foods, including vegetable oils, but also cereals. And, and as you heard before, um, account for about a third of the world's uh, wheat exports. And Lena, can you talk about the countries that are, have been most uh, affected in Africa and what conditions there are on the ground? Yeah, so the report that we that we released last week looked specifically at the situations in Nigeria, in Cameroon, as well as in Kenya. And here the situations are, are quite dire, where, um, again, six, seven out of 10 people are experiencing food insecurity and are not having um, enough to eat um, or enough quality food. And... So, so the implications are are huge also for the long term, um, since it may affect economic well-being um, 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 in the years to come. So it's not only an immediate emergency, but also uh, long term. But generally speaking, I would say the countries most affected in the regions are those uh, where government budgets are already quite tight and that have taken on more debt as the pandemic progressed, um, which limits their, their um, ability to respond to this emergency situation in providing more food or financial assistance to their populations and where food insecurity was already very high. Um, an additional layer that I should mention is also that some countries like Cameroon have over time shifted their, um, their agricultural model and have depended more on, on food imports rather than the domestic production. So these sort of the countries that are very import dependent are now the ones that are particularly affected by uh, these disruptions in the global commodity markets. Can you talk Lena, you can, Lena, can you talk about solutions um, uh, that are being proposed? And also, um, if you are seeing that f the increased funding for weapons in Ukraine is being taken directly from humanitarian relief in places like Africa. So in, in terms of the solutions, we are calling for more economic, so financial assistance going to countries in need. We also call for more social protection for people on the ground, which means providing them a safety net in situations where food is getting more expensive, which um, many uh, people can't afford. And um, and this includes, of course, the question around global aid, where where is it going and can we shift um, in, in these crisis modes? Um, here again, I, would, I need to point out the um, the, the danger of the increase in the global food prices that is presented to organizations like the, the World Food Program, um, which pro, which uh, gathers or used to gather 50 percent of the wheat it supplies in other countries from Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, so that has been disrupted enormously. So what we are calling for is 
um, on other exporting countries like the United States, Canada, and, and other countries to also open their markets, to not introduce export restrictions and provide uh, essential grains at an affordable price to humanitarian organizations um, so they can further support countries and populations in need. And finally, Lena, uh, the report points to the role of uh, international uh, multilateral financial institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, could you explain the role they might play in uh, exacerbating the crisis and what you think they ought to do instead, what they can do to alleviate it? Yes, international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank play a, a huge role in supporting countries in in times like these with loans um, and and financial support in in responding. However, um, there is a huge concern that many of these um, of um, of these packages come with strings attached, calling for austerity measures in uh, in the near or more distant future. Um, so this could lead to cuts in, in social spending and education and healthcare. Um, these are practices that we've seen in the past um, conducted by, by such organizations, and we're calling on them to look for alternative ways to recuperate um, some of these um, debt levels. And that could be done by more progressive um, taxation measures, um, corporate taxes, addressing um, tax avoidance, um, and tax evasion. So instead of putting the burden on people who are already suffering the most and people in poverty to search for alternative situations and avoid austerity um, that are harmful to human rights. Lena Summit, we want to thank you for joining us. Human Rights Watch, a senior researcher and advocate on poverty and inequality. We will link to the report as war continues, Africa food crisis looms. Coming up, the European Union's unveiled proposal to ban all Russian oil imports by the end of the year. We'll go to Ukraine to get response. Stay with us.